Welcome to Revved Up for Sunday, everyone. We're the clergy of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan, Connecticut. I'm Elizabeth Garnsey. I'm Peter Walsh. I'm John Kennedy. We're back with our, our podcast about the gospel for the upcoming Sunday. And this Sunday, we've reached Easter 2. Happy Easter, everyone. We're at the very end of the Gospel of John. Uh, we get the climax and culminating passages in this beautiful Gospel. And uh, we get familiar so-called doubting Thomas, and we get something about peace and retaining and forgiving sins. So let's hear the text. It's a jam-packed one. John 20, verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. End of gospel, the gospel of the Lord. Yeah, wowzer. I mean, this, mm -hmm. is, this, this is a significant and very important passage in our tradition. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's signal... Uh, by the fact that this is always the reading on the second Sunday of Easter, whether or not you're in the cycle A or cycle B or cycle C. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, uh, it's interesting. I used to not like the passage that much because it collapsed into it so much that I, I wanted it to actually spread out. But just to get us started and set the context uh, um petit peu here. So we have the second resurrection appearance uh, behind closed doors in the gift of peace, as you said at the outset. We have the equivalent of the Great Commission, which comes in a different spot at the end of Matthew, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. We have a mysterious task, which we can get to in a little bit. We have the equivalent of a Pentecost event, the conveying of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, we have echoes of recreation at that point with, uh, with the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. Then we get the third resurrection appearance a week later with Thomas, and we have doubt as a path to faith. We have the greatest confession of faith in the book, My Lord and My God. We have the second beatitude, Blessed are those who have not seen. And then we have the conclusion, What was this all about? Why did I put this whole gospel together? This coming from John speaking to John's community, so to speak, whoever we call, whoever John was. And there's the two steps, believe and have life in his name. So that, that this thing is, this thing is chock full. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is. I mean, we can launch in with the Holy Spirit, perhaps the, the breath, but just to say, uh, again, what, what you alluded to, that there's some new creation theology going on here. Uh, we, we've highlighted that in recent pods and it's still here as well. Um, this is of course taking place on Easter day in the evening. And the text says, again, that is the first day of the week, which is sort of the first day of a new creation. And, and that theme continues to echo here. And, and, uh, well, I guess we could linger on peace for a second. I mean, I, I see with, with the statement about peace, one, obviously a fulfillment of something he was saying in the Last Supper discourse in chapters 14 through 17, specifically 14 and 16, where he says, you know, 
peace I leave with you, my own peace I, I, I give to you. I do not give as the world gives and so on. So, so this peace is being given, but also I hear an echo of the sort of shalom of creation. Mm. This, this Hebrew sense of peace or shalom, which is more than, of course, than, you know, absence of conflict or so on, but sort of a, a wholeness and a harmony to, to creation um, that, that Jesus is, is um, sharing and, and spreading in some way. Uh, but then, of course, he breathes on his disciples. So this, as, as you said, Peter, is a Pentecost moment. And the interesting question for me is, how is this gift of the Spirit, how is this receiving of the Spirit, which Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit, how is this um, a new way of receiving the Spirit that is made available through Jesus, maybe principally through his death and resurrection, uh, that is different than how the Spirit is perhaps present and available to people before that and otherwise. What what changes Mm -hmm. uh, with regards to people's reception of the Spirit through Jesus? Both of you are setting us up beautifully. It's so nice um, to to hear your insights. Um, The breathing, I I think, is super interesting here in this passage because I love, you know, once again with John, we get so much meaning in a, in a one glimpse of an image where it's the recreation, the renewal of humankind, and we get the Pentecost idea. Also, I think that Jesus is imparting agency to mm. his disciples in a way and to all of us when, you know, Jesus is uh, kind of communicating to them that it's no longer going to be like the God from outside coming to rescue. You know, they can't look up and later in Luke, I mean, with, with the Luke and Luke Acts narrative, we get this idea that the disciples are still looking up for someone to come and help, you know. But here, Jesus is like, no, you, you're in charge. You're going to go do what I do, and I give you my whole spirit to go and do it, you know. And they don't have somebody from the outside coming to, you know, to, to rescue the God who, who will come from on high, you know. I mean, well, the God has come on from on high, but now it's up to us. It's up to the people to go and live the way of Christ and forgive sins, you know? Wow. Okay. So each of you just took on five, five things. And so I'm left a little bit bollocksed on which one to pick up. Um, and, and, and it's, it's super easy to talk and take on five things because John's gospel is like poetry. And so Mm -hmm. each word, you know, you know, if you, if you write, if you write an essay, you go paragraph to paragraph, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And in John's gospel, you get a poet or like a musical thing where many things can be happening all at once. And so that's essentially what's happening here. The, the, the gospel, in my opinion, or in this scene goes one, two, three, four, five, six, but it also, it also, is like music in that there's undertones and overtones and all of these sorts of things. And so, uh, you, you know, for my my reading, everything you're saying is true. So, uh, assuredly, let's just start with the resurrection. It's a resurrection appearance. Mm-hmm. And and yes, uh, Jesus has a different body, which I'm going to call my Easter sermon, which is, this is before the Easter sermon. You know, <laughs> same, same, but different, which yeah. is he yeah. has the same, he has the same body as, you know, touch my hands and stay, you know, where the sp- peer, spear went in his side but he's different and and the different what we call glorified body or resurrected body or, or, or the east has many other gradations of potential ways of naming this body but he's uh, he is no longer bound by the physicality that we have he can appear on other sides of doors he can you know seem to seemingly almost like bilocate uh, mm-hmm. and he so he's not bound by the materiality that we're bound by because uh, of a different level of spirituality in his body. So we would say the transfiguration was a fully human and fully divine revealed, but in John's gospel, there is no transfiguration. It's always, it's all that re- revealing all the time. But now in the resurrection, in the, in the when I am raised up, we have a different form of body. And I, I think this is the most exciting and the most discomforting portion of the resurrection narratives where it's easy to understand Christmas because we got a birth. It's easy to understand Good Friday because we got a death. It's easy to understand Pentecost because God is spirit. And now we're having to face materiality and spirituality in a way that we're uncomfortable with, which is exactly what, in my mind, um, the, what the, what life is in, in the Jesus world. So he breaks through all of the rules that we apply from our, our earthbound materiality. This is the end of science. Science goes as far as materiality. And now we're into spirituality. 
and materiality together. So he's able to come and go in these ways. So just as I'm just even starting with the resurrection of parents, he appears in a way that is in a way that others cannot appear. I'll mm-hmm. just leave it at that. Just, just pick on one thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that, that you're drawing on, on Eastern traditions there, which is um, perhaps more developed than, than Christian traditions and thinking about um, the way that, that the spiritual world uh, intersects with, with the physical world and the ways in which um, what we would call the miraculous sort of can happen. Uh, and, and for that reason, um, you know, I, I mean, you know better than I, Peter, because you just came back from India, but you know, a lot of people in India have like no problem believing in things like the resurrection because they have local stories about, you know, gurus and so on who just like went into a cave for 20 years and were like in suspended, like, you know, um, like in hibernation and then they can just sort of come out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's stories upon stories like that. But, but yeah, Jesus's body is, is, uh, is, is different. And, and so the reason why I wanted to save that for later is because uh, I think there's a really important connection to be made between the physicality of Jesus's body and the, the um, point of the book um, that, that John says, which is uh, that those who read it or hear it may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but maybe we'll just sort of table that. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, something else to say about um, the, the Pentecost and breath moment. I, I want to come back to what, what Elizabeth was saying. Uh, but before that, uh, more Genesis parallels is uh, are found here in that we have, of course, the spirit hovering over uh, the waters in, uh, in, in creation mm-hmm. uh, in, in Genesis chapter 1, or at least wind. So the Hebrew word there is ruach. Uh, in our NRSV, it's translated wind. In other maybe earlier translations, it's been translated spirit, but it's the same word for wind and spirit. Likewise, in Greek, we have the same word, which is pneuma for mm-hmm. wind and spirit. Um, so there's that going on, but there's also uh, an allusion to God breathing the breath of life into the nostrils of Adam, the first, um, the first person, the first man Mm -hmm. and Jesus breathing a new sort of breath of life into his disciples, which I think is super interesting on its own, but especially when uh, paired with uh, details that we talked about, I talked about perhaps last time um, and and the time before that with, with Pontius Pilate saying, behold the man in mm-hmm. Jesus's trial mm-hmm. and this happening on the sixth day of creation, which, um, or rather the, the sixth day of the week, excuse me. Yeah. Um, when, uh, in according to the order of days in Genesis chapter one, human beings were created. So Jesus is put to death on, on the sixth day mm-hmm. and he's called the man. He is the new man. He is the new Adam. Um, and here Jesus is sort of extending that, that newness, uh, the, that new humanity to his apostles. And then because they are apostles, Apostles, they are sent, right? Jesus right. says, I am sending you as the father has sent me. There's, there's a parallel. Uh, there, there's a, a parody and symmetry between who Jesus is and what Jesus does and who the apostles are and what mm-hmm. the apostles are to do. Mm-hmm. So that's part of how this new creation spreads into the world. You know, Jesus brings it, he accomplishes it in some way. And then the, the apostles are to carry it on and sort of implement it. Mm-hmm. And that extends right to us too. I mean, that's what being church means. We're not just remembering Jesus in the events of the Bible and trying to like follow his teachings. Mm-hmm. We are his continued presence. We right. are at that continued mission. Mm-hmm. Um, we are, you know, the, the, this is the legacy of, of Jesus and the apostles, which I find right. just super energizing. It's like, mm-hmm. well, of course I want to be part of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's social I like spirituality. That. I mean, people talk about, oh, nice. Good uh, phrase. You, it, people always want to differentiate between religious or spiritual. And, mm, you know, nice. I think when we're really grasping what's going on here and what Jesus is commissioning the disciples slash apostles to do and us is to get out and do the work. And, you know, we can't do it in isolation. You can't just go into your cave. You can, you need, we need to go into our caves to, you know, commune with that spirit and be charged and recharged. But unless we're coming back out again, the movement isn't spreading, you know, Mm -hmm. the forgiveness is not being communicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, for me, all of the physical and spiritual uh, dichotomy or, you know, conundrums here, they're not as rel- they're not important if all of the resurrection isn't embodied in humanity, <laughs> because so what if Jesus is walking through doors, if no one's changed by it? Mm. So that's where I come down on this first paragraph of this passage that, you know, Jesus comes through the door and they 
can look at his hands inside. Um, but the, the point is because he's proving to them that actually he was crucified, not that he was raised. He's trying to prove that, look what kind of Messiah I am. And um, we can talk about that too when we get to mm-hmm. Thomas. But mm-hmm. anyway, I, I think that all of it is in order to um, help them see that they, they are receiving something to go and share. Yeah. And that's the embodiment, the bodily resurrection in the end. Yeah, I, I mostly agree with what you say. I mean, I, I agree with what you say for sure, but it always, it's always a little bit challenging because I, I don't fully agree that it's not a big deal that Jesus shows up to them. I didn't say it wasn't a big uh, oh deal. Oh, yeah, because I, I, I think that actually is the game changer, is that Jesus shows up. And that the it's actually the presence of Christ, which is the game changer, period. So he shows up to them physically, or spiritually, physically. He's not a ghost. He, this is not docetism. He's a, still, still a person. And then in the breathing of his spirit, he is conveying him to them, Mm-hmm. That's what's happening. I think, yeah, that's and and I but it's you know, but it is. It's I guess it's the him him that, that is what matters, and, and whether or not it's him that you can touch or feed, or or him that he breathes on you. You, John, you had put out there. What's the spirit about? Well, the spirit. The difference between the spirit in Genesis one and the spirit that Jesus breathes on them, or the spirit that is blown into. Uh, uh, Adam's nose in Genesis 2 or the spirit that's blown into the disciples faces uh, in the upper room if this is the upper room it's not named as such is that that spirit this spirit has particularity mm-hmm. uh, it has Jesus particularity yeah. and in John's gospel that spirit can't be fully released until the resur- until the crucifixion and the in the resurrection and so he's blowing the spirit of the second person of the trinity yeah. so to speak onto them and so they are now to your point I love your phrase social spirituality I never heard that phrase for that you should write a book called social yeah. spirituality <laughs> according to Rev E uh, and and Great. lay out lay, lay out your thoughts because you got great thoughts <laughs> and that the social spirituality is just as you say the sending is I mean, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. In John's gospel, the word as is enormous because every time he, the John uses the word as, it's a continuation. It's not mm-hmm. something new. It's a continuation of the Jesus ministry right into what you're talking about, John. You know, and the church signed me up because yeah. it's Jesus' thing, right? right? The church is Jesus' thing. It's not its own thing. It's Jesus' thing. Yeah. And so it's in the asness of it all. There's just a complete flow to the whole thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, but the body is part of the flow until the ascension when, the, when it's all spirit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and and for this reason, I mean, and this is something that's been, you know, talked about for, for a while now, but maybe this is a good place to just say it here that, um, churches that back away from Jesus shrivel up and die because they've lost, they've lost the plot. Mm -hmm. You know, when you get shy about Jesus game over. Um, so don't be shy about Jesus church (laughs) people. Um, so anyway, um, so we're talking about the spirit and we've touched on the forgiveness and retention of sins, but the spirit flows into that. Right. So, um, can we just talk about retention of forgiveness and retention of sins yes. for one thing? Yeah. We can't skip over that. We, no, no. I, I, mean, I want to, oh, okay. I'm, oh, I'm, wanna, I'm trying to, to, Oh, you're trying to get there. Okay. Yeah. yeah but, no, but keep going. Keep going. Don't yeah. retain him. Yeah. Don't retain <laughs> him. The, the, the spirit. I forgive you, John. The spirit like, like wind flows into this forgiveness and retention of sins, which I find so interesting. Of course, perhaps just <laughs> stating the obvious here, it is the Johannine parallel to the key, keys of the kingdom passage in Matthew oh, chapter 16, mm-hmm. where uh, it, it follows Peter's confession of Jesus as the Messiah. And Peter uh, gets therefore named as Peter before that he was Simon, because Peter means rock. And um, Jesus says to him, on, on this rock, I will build my church and, and hand to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And if you uh, loose the sins of any, they are loosed. If you bind the sins of any, they are bound. Uh, that's a bit of a par- paraphrase, but, but loosing and binding is the mm-hmm. Mithian language and mm-hmm. for, uh, forgiving and retaining is the Johannine language, but mm-hmm. largely, I think, the same meaning. Um, and it's an interesting thing because, like, who are we to forgive sins? Never mind retain sins. Like, God alone forgives sins. I mean, this is the controversy, especially uh, uh, noticeable in Mark's gospel, where Jesus, at the very beginning of his ministry, gets into trouble because he tells people, you know, go in peace, your sins are forgiven. Mm-hmm. And, and the Pharisees and company are grumbling, like, yeah. well, you know, who can forgive sins but God alone? Right. Like, who is this guy to speak with this authority? And now Jesus is giving that authority 
to the apostles. But I think that only makes sense in light of this gift of the Spirit, because now they have the Spirit of Jesus. They have the life of Jesus, Mm -hmm. and they actually have the authority of Jesus, which is a shocking thing. Mm -hmm. I think forgiveness of sins is a lot easier to um, understand than retention of sins. So so what do you two make of, of this of this power that apparently we are given to forgive and retain sins? Um, I don't, I, th- I think I, I mean, I understand that, that it's something that the Pharisees felt only God could do. I just think that the whole project is to forgive. And I think it's, Jesus tells them to forgive before we get to this point. Mm-hmm. And he tells <clears throat> Peter, you know, or Peter says, how many times do I have to forgive? 70 times seven. You know, it's already a thing he's instructed them to, to get busy with. And, um, but I think that here it's next level because he has just demonstrated to them the ultimate forgiveness, you know, to come back from his murder and not retaliate to anyone, you know, and that is like, a shocker and that's a different kind of solution <clears throat> to to human violence than humans would take you know we we and i think okay so for example in <clears throat> genesis 2 22 you know when abraham's told to go bind isaac um one commentator says we can view this john passage through that type of binding akeda or akeda i don't do hebrew but that's what the word looks like to me on the page akeda <clears throat> which means binding it's the word that you know abraham was to bind isaac and then he is released from that sacrifice and here jesus is you know he's releasing us from our sacrifices our sacrificial ways where you know, if it was us, if it was up to us, we would want to go and get those people that put Jesus on the cross. And it would be totally justified in our minds that we could, you know, say, well, how this was the worst kind of offense. And so whoever did this deserves to be punished, you know. And um, it's hard for us to say Jesus was murdered. Some people want to say, well, no, God ordained that death from the beginnings for our salvation. Therefore, you know, that was, that was different. And when we've tried to say, you know, we shouldn't kill because, um, you know, Jesus was killed and we're just doing the same thing, some would argue, but Jesus's death was different because God meant to, God meant for it to happen, you know, and that's how we justify our, our killing is that, no, that was, they were, that criminal did the worst, so therefore he deserves to die. You know, we, we have a myth attached to why we kill the same way that we'd like to put a myth to why Jesus was killed, but in fact, Jesus was murdered and came back to forgive everybody to, from doing it. So who are we not to forgive? That took a long time for me to explain, I'm sorry. But I don't even know if it was clear. <laughs> wow. I just think, how could we not forgive when, you know, if he can forgive that? So I'm, I feel like I'm father disagreeable. Uh, uh, I mean, I, or, or having to learn and learn and learn again from each of you, because I come from this from a very different spot than both of you uh, do. I feel and, like it was just very unclear, and, sorry. No, no, I yeah. think you're very clear, actually. And, 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 and you have, for 136 podcasts, taught me over and <laughs> Ruby, over and Ruby. over. You have, and, and John, you for you know, 30 or something like that. It's so, actually one year for me. Uh, <gasps> this one is, liturgical year of oh, podcast. Yeah. Oh, this wow. is huge, okay, huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Ron makes like some explosive stuff come onto the yeah. podcast. Yeah, let's hear, the, la- let's hear the cheer track. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and so I have a different point of view about this. Most difficult line for me. Um, and, and so, John, you've presented the Mithean view, which is really based in the rabbinical view of loosing and binding. That's a rabbinical idea that Matthew, as a rabbi to Christians, is taking and taking the rabbinical idea and translating it to a church idea, which is what much of what Matthew's gospel is about. And that uh, that gospel has had an enormous effect on the church and led to the sacerdotal idea of the sacrament of, of penance mm-hmm. and reconciliation all this stuff, all of which I think has absolutely little to nothing to do with what the passage is about here. Now, maybe some, maybe some echo, but I don't think it's the main point. 
Uh, secondly, Elizabeth, you, you know, you're you're teaching me and all the rest of us about f- Jesus's disposition to uh, uh, forgiveness and never violence. The nonviolent Jesus is, I think, the one of the greatest things I will take away from my time at St. Mark's Episcopal Church when I retire is your being a teacher to me. I oh, mean, you wow. have taught me phenomenal things. Uh, and and now to you know my small point of view. Uh, Because I think it's smaller than each of yours, but I don't think that that's what the passage is about. I think that the passage is about when the context of the passage and in the context of the Johannine passage, uh, there doesn't seem to be any church structure in John's God in the, in the Johannine community, mm-hmm. the community is the structure. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so they, they don't have, it can't lead, doesn't lead to sacerdotal kind of sacrament of reconciliation. We're going to tell the people what sacerdotal means. Sacramental. Yeah. Um, priestly or priestly, yeah. priestly, priestly jobs that, of administration. My mom's going to ask me what that word is. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Welcome, just, mom. I'm trying to show off my intelligence, everybody. How am I doing? It's not going so well. That was a Don't respond. Word. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> send a text way. to Rob. Uh, Peter's not, and he's not carrying his weight. Uh, anyway, uh, I think that, that in the context of John's gospel, what we have is exactly right, that the Holy Spirit has just been given, and that sin in John's gospel is this thing that makes us super uncomfortable, which is to believe is righteousness, that's not John's word, but to, and, but to not believe is sin. And so that the sin they're referring to is, is fixed by Thomas in the next passage, which is this has, all has to do with the gospel. This whole passage is about believing and coming to faith. And those who refuse to come to faith have, this is the, the form of the sin that's being discussed here. And so salvation and judgment in John, which is super uncomfortable, if, if, if you don't mind my saying super uncomfortable for me, this the whole thing's about Easter faith is mm-hmm. what the passage is about. So that's what this is really about. And so the, we are to breathe. What's our, what's, you know, go and do. We, the breath that we get is to breathe, to tell the story mm-hmm. because that's how it is. That's how the spirit of God comes through our breath, through our word in mm-hmm. that way. So I might not have been too clear either in that, yeah. but that's kind of yeah. emphasis mm-hmm. on the slava where I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, so, John, you want to give yeah, us John, some Thomas? Yeah, John, fire away on doubt. Oh, sure. Well, since I have the mic, I, I just want to say one thing about forgiveness of sins is that I, I think there's an important difference between forgiving sins that are done to us, mm-hmm. which is what Jesus is has uh-huh. been consistently teaching, which, of course, anybody can do, um, and being able to say to other people, you know, your sins in general terms are forgiven because we are bringing the life and the spirit of Jesus to you, and that that is forgiveness without qualification without limit um, and to reject that offer of forgiveness is to sort of have your sins retained I think that's consistent with Jesus saying you know if you yeah. go to a, a village and they do not receive you you know shake the dust off your feet sort so of thing. I, I think a tough thing yeah but I, uh, but I think the, the great teaching of Jesus I mean God, this guy I'm unbelievable the more you sort of got to get a hold of this guy the more you go oh my so this gets like right in there with do not judge right I mean mm-hmm. what does that do to us I mean that that sets us free yeah. but the whole idea of forgiveness it, back to what you've been talking about from early podcasts <laughs> is all what you said it's all about the new creation on the first mm-hmm. day right and so right. What, how do you get a new creation you forgive mm-hmm. you don't let yesterday be your yeah. dictate for today Absolutely. if you just forgive forgive mm-hmm. forgive and you as a new creation mm-hmm. that yeah. that's the that's the actual exercise of new creation is by forgiveness yeah you know letting go and letting it's forgiveness go. for love's sake it's not mm-hmm. it's not this kind of pie in the sky oh let's just let it go right none of us are saying that but i think that that is the recreation of the world yeah, like you're yeah, saying definitely and, and, definitely and that's where the faith comes in is that you have to believe that in the end it's going to work it's just you can't give up on it right and so the yeah. faith in jesus is to have faith that this is the way and not retribution and not not forgiving because it was beyond the pale or something like that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we have to have faith that actually non you know i'm going to say it again non-violence but you know, like Martin Luther King Jr., he, his whole life was an embodied forgiveness of the wrongs done to his people. And mm-hmm. it, that was his way of changing the whole picture. Mm-hmm. And that's what yeah. Jesus is about here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, so much more to say about that, yeah. obviously. But, but um, let's talk a little bit about Thomas. He's getting short shrift here. That's okay. He gets the second Sunday of Easter every year. So, so I don't worry too much about Thomas here. But, of course, he wasn't there on this uh, Easter day, which we have been talking about. So um, he says, I won't believe it. And then one week later, uh, Jesus does the same thing. He appears in this 
um, locked room. It says the doors were shut this time. It doesn't say locked. So maybe they're a little less afraid this time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But either way, Jesus appears in very much the same way and says the same thing. Peace be with you. And then like he shows his hands and his side, his his wounds to uh, the disciples the previous week, he says to Thomas, you know, put your finger here. You can touch me. And, uh, and Thomas says, my Lord and my God, which as Peter, you said, is the strongest statement of Jesus's divinity in the entire New Testament. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just a shocking thing because, um, you know, Mm -hmm. Thomas, a Jew is saying this about a human being. This was one of the great controversies between, um, the, the, the Jews, uh, who did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah and the Christian movement and, and, um, the, the, uh, what was originally a, a Jewish, uh, movement around Jesus as the Messiah and the son of God, you know, for Jews who did not accept this, they couldn't get their head around the idea that God could ever be a human being. You know, you don't represent God visually. This, this sentiment is very much uh, alive today in, in Islam where you're not even supposed to depict the prophet Muhammad, Never mind, um, God. Mm-hmm. So it's a shocking and very, very strong statement. It's the strongest statement of this sort of thing. And it's, uh, it's a fulfillment of, um, what we get all the way back in John chapter one, the prologue, where no one has ever seen God. It is God, the only son who is close to the father's heart, who has made him known. He has made the invisible God visible. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> That's really yeah. well said. And I love that you called this the second beatitude. You want to say anything about yeah. that or? Well, there is one other. The, blessed are those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or, or you can too. I, I mean, the, the, in the whole of the chapter is about, doubt and faith or mm-hmm. believing mm-hmm. in doubt. And we just to context that again, because we're really reading this and with reference to the first 18 verses too. So Mary goes to the tomb and nothing happens. And then at the end, Mary, Mary sees with a hereo with the, with the, the spiritual insight. And she believes we then have Peter and John going to the tomb. Peter goes to the tomb and he's theorizing, but he doesn't. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it don't, it don't happen. And then um, you know, John looks in the tomb and he believes, and then we have Thomas who's unbelieving, and and then uh, you mm-hmm. know we have doubting mm-hmm. who's then believing, and then we get to the whole purpose of the gospel is that mm-hmm. we would believe, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, and and the beatitude is blessed are those who, you know who who believe and yet have not seen, which mm-hmm. is all the rest of us, mm-hmm. right? That's written to the that's written to the world, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so that's you know that's a, that's why I think that is the reason that this is in cycle A, B, and C is that one line. Mm-hmm. Is that beatitude? Wow. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Nice. Nice. I think, I think that sounds right on. Well, there you have it, people. We're going to hear some more maybe in a sermon, God willing, and the Holy Spirit consenting. And, uh, and Rob thank you not so cutting much. us and short Rob, here. Yeah, I'm gonna, That's I'm a whole other thing. Yeah. yeah. I think we've run out of time, but we've we really honestly could go on for a week and hear this passage just, just two weeks. So, yeah. <laughs> and um, believe it or not, we got a voicemail. Our beloved oh, Marsha Fallon God. in Florida has given us a thought. Wonderful, yes. So, Marsha. Rob, you want to roll tape, and we'll, we'd love to respond to Marsha. It's Marsha Fallon, and I just, well, I really love these podcasts. They always grab me. I've been watching on television lately, so I haven't been leaving as many comments. But this Sunday reminded me of another Sunday when Justin was talking and it was another one of his mic drop moments, I'll tell you. So I just wanted to share it. Um, he was talking about two very different processions riding into Jerusalem at the same time from different directions, just as we were talking about on the podcast. And then this is Justin's mic drop. Just as he rode through the stone walls of Jerusalem and into the tumultuous activity of the city, so he rides through the stone walls of our hearts and into the tumultuous activity of our lives. He rode into the chaos so that we may have his peace. Ta-dum, ba-ba-boom. I'm telling you, I love that. (laughs) Anyway, I miss you guys. Wish I could talk to you in person, but um, this is awesome too. Be well and have a beautiful Holy Week and a very blessed Easter. 
Hey, Marcia, thank you uh, for your commentary. We all leaned in and listened, uh, and there is no doubt that Justin has a great an incredible gift. Uh, and that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, how much I'd learned from you and how much I learned from you, John, I learned so much from Justin too. Uh, and I know Elizabeth, you spoke about the horses coming from, from, uh, the horse and the donkey coming from opposite ends of town, symbolizing very, very different understandings of how power is to be exercised first earthly and then divine. And Justin's beautiful, bringing it into the human heart. Just, I mean, I just would say in Jesus language, amen, amen. Beautifully done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So if you'd like to leave us a voicemail, the number is 203-442-5002. We love hearing from you. So again, happy Easter. Have a blessed week.